we are here to remember that Jesus is alive. The stone was rolled away. The tomb is empty. And he is risen. Someone say amen. Amen. I mean, that's what we're here to celebrate. That's what this is all about. But, but I worry sometimes when we gather at a time like Easter that we might, we might miss what it's really about because to understand what Easter is about, you have to kind of rewind the clock and go back a ways and, and understand what led up to this empty tomb. In a sense, coming to Easter services and hearing an Easter message and not knowing what happened before is like somebody telling you a joke, but they don't bother with a joke, they just tell you the punchline. And, and you, don't, you don't really get it. So, so I thought I'd try that. I'm going to tell you three jokes. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you the joke. I'm just going to give you the punchline. We're going to see how this works, okay? We're going to see. Because I'm, I'm incredibly funny. Uh, and so, so, so here, here's, the, here's the first joke. Here's the, it's just the punchline, okay? Just one. But the light has to really want to change. It didn't go over real well, did it? No, no. But that, that's wicked funny, just so you know. Okay, here's the second joke. Here's the second joke. And this is just the punchline. You ready? Here it is. Here it is. Moo! See, a couple of you know that one, don't you? That's hilarious. That's incredible, right? Some of you are like, I, I don't get it. That, that's all right. Okay, here's my third joke. Here's my third joke. Just, just the punchline. Just the punchline, okay? Well, hey, <laughs> apparently some people can't tell a joke. See, it doesn't really work, does it? No, it doesn't. In the same way... Easter, without knowing what comes before it, doesn't make sense. So you're thinking, well, what are the jokes? Let me tell you. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take them one at a time. The first one's a really easy, it's a light bulb joke. joke. So here, here it is. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Here's the answer. Just one. But the light bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> Get it? Okay, it'll, it'll hit you later. It'll hit you later. Okay, okay. Here's the second joke. Here's the second joke, the whole joke, okay? And you gotta help me. This is a knock knock joke, so you gotta work with me here, okay? Ready? Okay, ready? Okay. Knock knock. Interrupting cow. Moo! (laughs) See how it works? Some of you are gonna tell that one later. Okay, here's my third joke. Here's my third joke, okay? So this guy starts working in a new office, and it's kind of kind of cubicle land, just rows and rows of cubicles. And, and one of his coworkers says, hey, in the middle of the afternoon, there's a 10-minute break, not enough time to go outside, but you can just, you know, check your phone and just, and, and, you know, just get caught up on things, personal things during that break. And also, people in our cubicle row tell some jokes. So he's like, okay, so it gets to be that break in the afternoon. First day, break in the afternoon. And he's just kind of sitting there, and he's, you know, checking his, checking his personal email. And all of a sudden, somebody in one of the cubicles stands up and goes, 14! And everybody starts cracking up. Everybody starts laughing. This guy's like, that wasn't funny. And a couple, couple of seconds later, another person in a different cubicle pops up and says, 27. And everybody starts cracking up and laughing. This guy's totally confused. So he kind of rolls his chair over to the opening of his cubicle. And he says to the guy across the hallway, he says, hey, what's, what's the deal with the numbers? And why is everybody laughing? And the guy says, oh, listen, most of us have worked here so long. We've all heard each other's jokes. So we've just numbered them. Okay, we just have numbers. And so all you got to do is call out the number and everybody knows the joke, and then they get to enjoy the humor of it. And it just, just goes quicker. It's only a 10-minute break, you know? So the, the, the guy's like, okay. He said, well, can I try? He says, give it a shot. So he kind of stands up in his cubicle, and he goes, 37. Nothing. Not a laugh, not a chuckle, nothing. So he gets, sits down in his chair. He rolls over the other guy. He says, I thought you said they all, you know, how many are there? The guy says, well, there's 90 of them. He says, well, there's number 37? Yeah, there is. He's like, okay. He says, well, can I try again? He says, give it a shot. The guy stands up, and he goes, 90. Nothing. I mean, nothing. And he gets in his chair, rolls over to the other guy, and he says, what's the deal? And the guy says, you know, hey, some people can't tell a joke. <laughs> okay, so you're going to tell those sometime today. I know you are, okay? Here's, here, here's the deal. It doesn't, you, you can't get it. You don't get the joke if you don't know what led up to it. You don't get Easter, You don't get Easter unless you turn the clock back and you know what comes leading up to it. You have to turn back about 33 years and nine months to when a young virgin girl who's never been with a man becomes pregnant because God decides he's coming into the world. And God Almighty, Emmanuel, becomes God with us. And and the Virgin Mary bears this child, Jesus. And Jesus is born and he he lives his whole life with no sin. No wrong, not, not a single bad thought, not an unkind word that cut people in a way, in a way that was hurtful or mean-spirited. He, not, not a, no action 
that was wrong before the Father. He lived this perfect, perfect life. And they took him, and they nailed him to a cross. And on that cross, he took our sins and our shame and our punishment. And then he died. And, and, and you, you have to understand that story. You have to understand what's happening with Jesus, because if all you do is stand and look into an empty tomb, it doesn't make sense. We don't understand what it's all about, but there's more to the story. God really entered human history, and Jesus Christ really came, Emmanuel, God with us. And we have to understand the reality of his life so we can understand the reality of his death, and then we can understand the reality of his resurrection. So Jesus, when he came to this world, came because perfect God could then offer for imperfect people a perfect sacrifice. And, and so when Jesus suffered and when Jesus hung on the cross and when he went to the cross, he experienced real relational pain and abandonment. God who came among us, who loved perfectly, was abandoned and experienced the same kind of relational pain you have experienced when people have abandoned you in your moment of need. When Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross and, he, and he's getting ready to die for our sins, we read this one little line in Mark chapter 14, verse 50. Then... Everyone deserted him and fled. All of Jesus' closest friends just ran and left him at his moment of need. The crowds that had just, just a short time before been saying, Hosanna, blessed is Jesus, the one who comes in the name of the Lord, are now screaming, crucify him. I mean, it's changed. They've spun, they've turned on him. He felt that just like you would feel it and I would feel it if somebody who loves you turns against you. He felt that. He also experienced real physical pain and agony. When Jesus hung on that cross, he felt what any person would have felt because he was one who came in human flesh. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, gave this prophetic word about the Savior who would come. And he writes these words in Isaiah 53. He says, but he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. When they scourged and whipped Jesus within an inch of his life, he felt it all. When he carried the cross up the hill and collapsed because of the weight of, us, weight of it, he felt it like you would have felt it or I would have felt it because he was carrying it for us, for you. And when he hung on the cross, gasping for air and dying. He felt it all. He suffered. It was a real death of a real person, God with us, Emmanuel. And there was also real spiritual pain and cost. There, there, and, and I believe that more than the emotional relational pain that Jesus experienced, more than the physical pain, which is what we tend to focus on, was the spiritual reality of what he bore. Because when Jesus hung on that cross, fulfilling the mission he came to this world for, to take our sins on himself so we wouldn't have to take them on ourselves. When he hung on that cross, all of our sins and all of our shame and all of our just stupid actions and harsh words and mean-spirited attitudes and everything we've thought and said and done that offends God, all of that and the punishment for all of that was placed on Jesus as he hung on the cross and he took it on himself. And he cried out this one word on the cross, to tell us die, which means it is finished. It's paid, paid in full. What was he talking about? The punishment for my sins, for your sins. We have to understand what Jesus went through. He had a real death. In Luke 23, 46, we read these words. This is while Jesus is hanging on the cross. It says, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. And Jesus, the pure and perfect and beautiful Lamb of God, Emmanuel, God with us, he drew his last breath in his lungs, the air of this world, and he stopped breathing. And his heart stopped beating. And he died. The soldiers took a spear and they drove it into his side and water and blood came gushing out because he, he was dead. He died. And then they took him and they put him in a tomb 
and they rolled the stone over to close it, done. Done with Jesus. The story's over. That's it. It's done. But the story doesn't end there. In Luke 24, we read these words. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices that they had prepared. This is spices for burial. And went to the tomb. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. It all came back to them. They understood what Jesus had prophesied, what he had said. Jesus really died. The, one, the God who really came among us, who really lived a perfect life with no sin, he really died on the cross. He was dead for three days. He was in the tomb, and he rose again. And when he rose, he showed up. I mean, he showed up to people. He showed up to some of the disciples. And they realized it was him. They were, they were just absolutely astonished. But Thomas wasn't there. So when they said, Thomas, Jesus showed up to us. You missed it. He's alive. Thomas is like, I doubt it. I don't think so. Thomas says, I won't believe it till I see him, till I see the nail prints in his hands, till I see where the, the, the spear went in his side. So what does Jesus do? He shows up to Thomas. He says, Thomas, put your hand right here. See the holes. Put your hand on my side. It's me. I'm alive. Thomas says, I believe. <laughs> I get it. Jesus shared meals with people after he rose from the dead, before he ascended back to heaven. He preached, he taught. He was truly, really alive. And this, this resurrection of Jesus changes everything. The resurrection of Jesus brings real victory. He won a victory, and then he offers that victory to us. Listen to these words from 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal has with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Someone say amen. Amen. He won the victory, and he gives us his victory. Victory over sin. All of our sins. Th through the death of Jesus, through his resurrection. <coughs> all of our sins are taken away. I mean, they're, they're, they're bundled up, and they're thrown in the deepest sea. They're gone. All, all of our shame, all of our guilt, all the stuff we hide from our families and our friends, and all the stuff we try to hide from ourselves. He sees it all. And on the cross, he dealt with it. And he says, that's done. That's gone. Sin is dealt with. And not just then, but forever. If you come to God through faith in Jesus, your sins are washed away. He had victory over death and the grave. All of our fear of death, all our fear of the grave can go away. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, here's the reality. Though you might die, your life will never end. Because when you belong to Jesus, you belong to him forever. When you take the victory he won on the cross, it becomes your victory and you're victorious over death and the grave and you're victorious over the enemy. We have a very real enemy of our souls who's trying to mess our lives up. And the Bible says that the one who's in us, Jesus, the risen Lord, he is greater than the one who's in the world. We're starting a series next week, a five-week series at Shoreline called Supernatural. And we're gonna look at all the supernatural stuff in the Bible from, from angels and demons to miracles to healing. I mean, every supernatural thing we're gonna say is the God the same yesterday, today, and forever? What's God, because God's still doing stuff like that. It's gonna be an incredible series. But, but this understanding that we can walk in victory over the enemy because of the victory of Jesus Christ unleashed in us. There's a real offer of life to us. Jesus spoke these words when he walked on this earth. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? This is, what, this is Jesus' promise. He offers resurrection, power, and life that begins now. That the resurrected Jesus Christ actually lives in us. When we come to Jesus, when we confess our sins, when we receive his forgiveness, and we choose to follow him, we become a Christian and follow Jesus. Now his resurrection power and his presence is alive in us, and we have a new life starting now. And that life lasts forever in glory. One of the sermons in the Supernatural series coming up in the next five weeks is looking at, at eternity. And what does that mean? What, is eternity real? And Jesus was clear that it was, and he opens the door for anyone who wants to be with him forever in eternity. It's incredible. His real life offers us the best life possible. When you know Jesus, you enter into the best life possible. Let me be clear. I didn't say the easiest life possible. Because following Jesus isn't always easy, but it is the best way to live. The best way possible. Listen to these words from John chapter 10. Again, Jesus is speaking, and he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief, that's the enemy, Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And listen to what Jesus says. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The fullest, best life, an abundant life beyond what we can imagine or dream can be found in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Cleansed hearts where the guilt and the shame that tears us down, Jesus says, I will wash that away and I will give you a new heart. I will lift your guilt and I will lift your shame and I will clean you up. Purpose and meaning. When you come to know Jesus, he says, I will give you a purpose for living. And, and, and try this on for size, try this on. Here, here's the primary purpose God gives. Spend your life loving God, loving God's people, and loving the world. Once you master that, he'll give you another objective. <laughs> just, just make sure you love God every day, love every person around you, love the world. And that, that's our mission. That's our purpose, and it's glorious. When you walk in the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, he offers healing. Well, healing of what? Healing of everything. I, I have watched... People with, with hearts so broken and so fragmented, you say there's no way they can find healing. And in Jesus Christ, I've watched the pieces of a person's heart be put back together in a, way, in a way that nobody else could have ever done. In Jesus Christ, fragmented, fractured relationships, where you look and say, there's no way this gets healed. There's no way there's reconciliation. And in Jesus Christ, he can bring people back together in a, gay, in a way that no other person could ever do. Healing in our bodies healing in our minds. Our God continues to heal in ways that no one else can. And his resurrection gives us power to forgive. In a, in a world, man, right now in our world, not only do people when they're to not forgive each other, man, people don't even talk to each other. We are becoming, we are becoming such a, a polarized, such a, a conflict-oriented world and Jesus says, I will let you so know my forgiveness and so know my cleansing and so know what it means to have new life that you could actually forgive somebody who wrongs you. And we look and go, that's impossible. And Jesus says, oh, no, it's not. I have power in my resurrection to do even that. We have to, this Easter, understand the real message, what this is all about. And, and can I tell you, on Easter, enjoy, you know, enjoy the pastels. You know? I don't wear purple any day of the year except for Easter. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's lovely. Enjoy it, right? Enjoy the family. Enjoy your, the food. Enjoy music. I mean, enjoy, enjoy all those things. But don't miss what this is all about. It, it, the message of Easter is truly simple and pure when you understand it. Here's the, here's the message of Easter. Listen closely. There is a God who knows everything about you, and he loves you. He knows everything. He loves you enough to leave heaven and come among us. Christmas, Jesus, Emmanuel, born in a manger. And that God lived 33 years on this planet, Jesus, Emmanuel, with no sin. That, that, that's the love of God seeking for you, searching for you. 
But the simple message of Easter is also this. We have a problem. And that is that God is here and he loves us. We are here and between us and God is this all this sin, all these thoughts we thought and things we said and things we've done and God who's perfect and holy, he can't just go, oh, no big deal. He's got to deal with this and so here we are, here's all of our sin and we can't get back to God because of all this junk that exists, all this sin. That's our problem because guess what? It's our sin. It's our thoughts and words and, and unkind deeds, all those things. So God says, I have a solution to this issue of sin. And that solution is Christmas, the life of Jesus, and Easter. It's Jesus. Jesus says, I will leave the glory of heaven. I will come among you. I will be the sinless, perfect lamb of God. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died to deal with the sin, my sin, your sin. And he took it on himself, and he paid the price and he took the shame, and he took the punishment, and he died, and he said, it's paid in full, it's finished, it's gone. And now, there's nothing between us and God. And we have to decide, how will I respond to this offer? Because God does not force himself on us. He offers himself. And he says, if you will accept this Jesus who, who took your sins, who died in your place, who gave his life for you, if you'll accept this Jesus and confess, man, I did those sins. That was me. That's, that's on me. And Jesus says, no, if you believe in me, it's on me. I'll take it. And then you just take the hand of Jesus and walk with him through your life. You become his follower. That's the invitation. That's what Easter's about. Yes, it's an empty tomb. That's real. Yes, he's risen. Absolutely. But Why? to offer to us this gift that we could never get on our own. And so I want to pray with you this Easter. Two simple prayers. One for people that have never yet said, I understand, and I want Jesus. And then one for those that say, I know Jesus, and I want to give him praise. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we come together right now, and we lift our hearts in prayer. There are some in this room and some in, in the family worship venue and our other venue and, and online today that have never understood what Easter was really about. They've never understood the love of God and the cost of sin and the work of Jesus. And Lord, some of those people today right now want to come and call out to you to become your follower. And if that's you today, would you just in your heart right now between you and God, would you say, oh God, I get it. For the first time, I understand. I understand what Jesus did and why he did it and that he did die on the cross for me and he rose again and so I just... I confess my wrongs and my sins. I say, Jesus, take them away. Let your work on the cross be enough. It is enough. I accept it to wash all my wrongs away. And then would you just pray and say, Jesus, and now take my hand and lead me all the days of my life and forevermore to be your follower. Let me follow you and love you and live for you. And if you prayed that prayer, if you just prayed that prayer, you have become part of God's family. He will wash your sins away. And I want to encourage you to do one thing on your way out of here today. Go across the lobby, and there's a big counter there with Bibles and a 50-day reading plan to learn how to read the Bible. Just go by and pick up a Bible and tell whichever pastor is there, just say, hey, I need a Bible. I, I prayed that prayer today. I want to challenge you to do that on your way out this morning. And for all of you who are here who have believed in Jesus before today, will you in your heart just say, Jesus, thank you. I'm reminded again, I get it. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your death on the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. Thank you for loving me that much. Fill me with your resurrection power every moment of every day to follow you and live for you. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you are alive, that your power is available, that you love us that much. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. And everyone said, amen. amen.